confessions, the confessions of a kingdom builder. We have any kingdom builders in the house today? <laughs> there are 10 different confessions of a kingdom builder, and I want us to look at these. The first one comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. It's, it's stewardship. Stewardship. It says, I recognize that nothing I have belongs to me, and it all comes from the Lord. I have been given stewardship over everything in my life. I am a godly steward of my time, talents, treasure, my tongue, my salvation, the anointing, and everything the Lord has given me. And that's what it comes down to, stewardship. The first and most important principle of having kingdom prosperity, being a kingdom builder, being a kingdom financier, being empowered, uh, not only by the anointing, but by faith and by the Holy Ghost, obviously, and by the Word of God and by, uh, you know, uh, material resources and finances is to be a good steward. Amen. And you have to recognize that nothing you have belongs to you. We're not owners. We are stewards. And as long as we steward everything, as the Bible says, you know, when we are good stewards, the Lord will find us faithful and he will entrust more into our hands. And we have to be good stewards of Time, everyone say time. time. Talents, time. treasures, time. our tongue. Time. Bible says we're going to give an account for every idle word we speak. Salvation, Salvation. man, the grace that we have received, the anointing, and everything the Lord has given us. Amen. And this is this is a key: being stewards. Second is second principles is seeking first the kingdom of God. This comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. God has the first priority in every area of my life. Say this after me. God has the first priority in every area of my life. And that's what it comes down to is prioritizing God and your relationship with the Lord. As I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, everything will be added on to me. I honor him. With my tithes and my first fruits, I give with a glad heart. Amen. Confess these until you become these. And act on the word. Don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. God's not looking for just people that hear the word, but he's looking for people that do the word. When you're faithful in doing the word, guess what happens? God gets involved in your life. Amen. The third confession concerns the love of money. We love Jesus, we don't love money, but because we love Jesus, we need money to make Jesus known. Come on, to bring Jesus to the world, we need money. To go on television, we need money. To broadcast, we need money. Cameras, everything. To propagate the gospel, to build churches in the foreign fields and here, and to do missions work, to do crusades, it all takes money. Amen. The love of money is the root of all evil. Therefore, I will never love money. Money has no power over me. I have power over it. That's it. Money is a tool. It's a great tool if you know how to use it. It's a terrible master when you don't know how to use it. So make sure that money is your servant, that it becomes a tool that you can use. Hallelujah. That it becomes a tool that you can use. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My character and conduct are free from the love of money. I do not serve two masters. I only serve God, not mammon, because I know that my heart is where my treasure is, and I will continually give my treasure to the Lord. Whatever the Lord asks me to give, I will obey and give freely. And that comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. The fourth confession comes concerning the power to create wealth. How many of you realize we've been given power to create wealth? What's the purpose? So that God can establish his covenant. Amen. The confession goes like this. It's not me, but it's God who gives me the power to create wealth. That comes from Deuteronomy 8.18, where it says, you know, don't say to yourself that the power of my own hand, my own might got me this wealth, because it is he, God, who gives me the power to create wealth. Amen. It's not me, but it's God who gives the power to create wealth. I receive his wisdom and ability to utilize that power in a way that glorifies him. God blesses the work of my hands, not the seat of my pants. Amen. Whatever I put my hands to prospers according to his will. 
We got too many lazy Christians, I'm sorry to say. They just want to, you know, I'm just, I'm believing God by faith, but they're not doing anything. Amen. They're not doing anything. You got to put your hand to something. You got to get moving in the right. You got to put feet to your faith. Hallelujah. The fifth confession is concerning remembering the Lord. This comes from Deuteronomy 8.18 also. No matter how wealthy I am, I will never forget the Lord. And that's, you know, I had a guy say to me, I don't want to get wealthy because what if I get wealthy and I backslide? Then you'll just be a fool. If that's the reason you don't want to get wealthy. So you're going to get, are you just expecting to backslide? No, I'm not expecting to backslide. I'm, I'm expecting to go from glory on to glory. I'm expecting to be changed and to grow in the things of God. <laughs> Come on, I'm expecting to mature in the things of God. I'm going to be a more mature believer. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. If you turn away from God, then you become a fool. Amen. But if you love the Lord and you want to serve his kingdom, why, why would you expect to backslide? Amen. So no matter how wealthy I am, I'll never forget the Lord. I'll stay committed to the local church. That's another important thing. We got too many Christians that say I'm a Christian, but they don't, do, they don't even go to church. They're not connected to a local church. They don't do anything for the kingdom of God. Because remember, the local church is a part of God's kingdom. How can you build the, the kingdom if you're not helping build the church? Because Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If Jesus is busy building his church, then we need to get involved in building the church. And that doesn't just mean building buildings. It, part of it is building buildings, but it's building the church as in bringing the harvest of souls, growing the church numerically, and advancing the church, and bring, growing the church spiritually. All of these things are a part of God's kingdom agenda. I'll stay committed to his word. I will always follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I will not be proud and arrogant. Again, that's what happens. If, if you're going to allow money to make you proud and arrogant, then pride comes before the fall. Yeah, you will fall. But you remain humble. And, the, the, and the, let me tell you right now, the best way that I have found that you keep your heart pure from the love of money is you be a radical giver. That you don't get attached to money. You don't, get, you don't hold on to it as your security. You don't hold on to it as your idol. But you freely give. Freely you have received, you freely give, you're a giver, you're a sower, you're, you're a blessing, you tithe, you bring your first fruits, you on top of it, you bring offerings to the Lord and, and, and advance the kingdom of God. That's, the, that's how you keep your heart in the right place. Amen. Hallelujah. I will not be proud and arrogant. I don't set my hopes on uncertain riches. My hope is always in God. And that's the problem with the world is they, their trust is in riches I mean, you see in various economic downturns and crises, you have people, you know, in Wall Street literally jumping out of high-rise buildings, committing suicide because they lost everything financially. But that's all they had because everything, all their trust was in the money. And when the money is gone, it's like they have no hope. Our hope is not in money. Our hope is in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. The sixth confession comes concerning divine protection. This is a good one. Because I'm a tither and a giver, God will rebuke the devourer for my sake. You need to understand, tithing is like divine protection. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Worship and reverentially honor God. Bible says to honor the Lord with our capital, with our giving. So as we honor God in our giving, guess what happens? We get angelic bodyguards. Who would like to have some angelic bodyguards? I mean, you got to pay a lot for some um, private security at the top level. I mean, some, you see some of these wealthy people out there, you know, they got bodyguards and 
they spent so much money, but you know what? I got angelic bodyguards. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. There's nothing like it having angelic bodyguards. Because God will rebuke the devourer for our sake. That means God, the enemy will not be able to touch you, your family, your body, your finances, your health. Come on, your children. You better realize the importance of tithing. I will know by the Spirit of God whom to do business with and, and whom not to do business with. I will not get into bad business deals or be cheated by anyone. That's another protection. Wisdom of God is your protection. Think about that. If you make unwise decisions, you can lose a lot. But if you make wise decisions because the Lord is leading you, guess what? There's protection in His wisdom. Hallelujah. God will set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Hallelujah. That comes from Malachi chapter 3 verse 11. Come on, somebody say, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. The seventh confession comes from supernatural blessings. Concerning supernatural blessings. It comes from Genesis 12 and 3. And I actually shared on this a um, couple of Wednesdays ago. Um, concerning the land covenant. How many of you were here for the Wednesday service? If you weren't, you need to go listen to that message because if we have the Abrahamic blessing, the first thing God promised Abraham was land. He said, I'll take you to a land and I'll give it to you and I'll bless you there. Hallelujah. We need every Christian to, to believe God for land and possess the land the Lord's given him. Hallelujah. We have a land covenant. Did you know you have a land covenant? Three of you, wonderful. The rest of you, you are you here today? Do you know that we have a land covenant? What was the first thing that came under attack? As soon as, right at, listen, right after the flood, and then of course Noah, his wife, his sons, their wives, there's eight people that were saved by water, remember? Right after that, when all the evil was wiped away, and it was like a reboot and a clean and a fresh start, what did God say? Scatter. Why? There's so much land. There's so much land. Scatter. Scatter. But what was the first thing that happened? The spirit of Antichrist came in to do what? Gather. Confine everyone to it small area so they can control them and have all the land for themselves and, and that's actually what's happening the, the number one thing that's going to be under attack with this new world order the great reset is what they call is they don't want to have anybody to have private property and they say by 2030 you'll own nothing you'll be happy and we'll just give you a like a stipend they call it uh, the universal uh what was it called uh, no, no no the universal basic income UBI, everybody's going to get just handed just enough crumbs to survive and eat worms and, and, and crickets and, and cockroach, drink cockroach milk. This is their plan. They openly speak about it. I'm not crazy. Go, go listen to what they speak at the World Economic Forum. These people just literally get up on stage and talk this stuff. And then, of course, the world's population is too big. They say we need to reduce it to 500 million. The world, the world can easily have 10 billion people. We're just at 8 billion. And I saw that if you took everyone on the planet, you can literally put them in the state of Florida. If you just put them in a, you know, I mean, so there's so much land. I saw this thing in Tokyo. People are literally living in, I think it's, it's the living space per individual is 200 square feet. There's all the, like 35 million people in, the, in Tokyo. People are sleeping in like, they look like, it like, looks like a mortuary, like, like a morgue. They, they, they have these little things that slide out like a drawer. It's like a bed. They go in it and they go in. I, I'm just, I was like, are you kidding me? They want, living, they want everybody living in little pods, like make the matrix, I guess. There's so much land. We need to have land. Every one of you need to have land. 
You need to have land, live off the land, grow your own food and everything. Because you see what they want. They want to, what, then if they don't, if, if having land is not good, how come Bill Gates has become the largest landowner in America buying up all the farmland? What do you think happened in Hawaii? That was happening in Turkey two summers ago. 150 forest fires. Millions of hectares burnt down. And then I just found out the globalist elite are buying all the land that burnt down. So it's all, it's all orchestrated. And we need to understand the demonic diabolical agenda. We need to stand on our covenant and not back down and take possession of what God has promised to give us. And we need to have aggressive faith to go in and, and possess the land. Not to be like the Israelites that perished in the wilderness because they saw themselves as grasshoppers and they said we are not able to do it because of the giants. The Lord is with us. We'll take out the giants. We'll go in and possess the promises that the Lord has given to us. We're not going to live in the wilderness and just enough and get by. We're going into the promised land. We're taking possession of more than enough because we serve Al Shaddai. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Say this after I am redeemed from the curse of poverty. Hallelujah. I cannot be cursed because whom God has blessed, no man can curse. I vow never to be poor. Do you realize in religion they make you take a vow of poverty? It's not bringing a curse on yourself. If you've ever taken a vow of poverty, repent right now and just take a vow of prosperity. Just say, I vow never to be poor. God's blessing makes me rich and he adds no sorrow with it. I'm blessed to be a blessing to others. I look for ways to bless others. Goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I might answer it, so you better turn it off. Eight. The eighth confession. Concerning eternal purpose, people don't even listen to the announcements when we tell them to turn off their phones. It's like, turn off your phones when you come in. Put them on silent. Or leave them in your car. That's probably even better. Bring a paper Bible. You don't get distracted. I think we need to go back to paper Bibles because you'll be looking at the Bible there and boom, something comes up, boom, and then you're like, now you're distracted. Good to have a paper Bible because they can't shut it down. What happens if they shut down the app? Then what? They all need to get paper Bibles. Go back to paper Bibles. Somebody say, which one should I get? Well, this one is a New King James and Amplified Parallel. It's a good one to start with. Hallelujah. The eight, confession eight comes from... A, one thing I learned over the years as a pastor, use every, every issue as a teaching opportunity. That was a teaching opportunity. Paper Bible. Say, I'm going to get me a paper Bible. We make the men put away their phones and use paper Bibles in Man of Valor Bible study so they don't get distracted. They're already distracted enough. The eighth confession is concerning eternal purpose. You're getting something out of this today. I am in this world, but I am not of this world. I'll never be distracted by the things of the world. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It's like a... I just have illustrated servants by accident. We need, some of these churches, they, they plan all these illustrations... And rehearse everything. The whole, it's like I don't, we don't rehearse nothing. And then all of a sudden we have illustration by accident. We have miracles by accident. 
Hallelujah. I am, I am in this world, but I'm not of this world. I will never be distracted by the things of the world. But I keep my eyes on eternity. Amen. Only thing I can take with me to heaven is souls. I'm a soul winner. I will fund the end time harvest. I do not lay up treasure on earth, but I lay up treasure in heaven. Hallelujah. And that comes from 2 Corinthians 4.18. Hallelujah. Praise God. Eternal purpose. We have to attach an eternal purpose to our lives. You have to attach an eternal purpose to everything you do. You have to attach an eternal purpose to your business. Otherwise, you just have a business like everybody else. But when you have attached an eternal purpose to your business, now you have a kingdom business. We call it kingdom business because kingdom comes before business. Because I ask business people all the time, why are you in business? And they go, oh, to make money? Eh. <laughs> Jesus never said, go into all the world and make money. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. Yeah. See, souls is the currency of the kingdom. That's eternal. When, you're, when, you're, when your finances bring souls into the kingdom, then your money has been converted into eternal currency. Yes. Convert your earthly treasure into eternal treasure. The conversion rate is phenomenal. I heard a story. Who's heard of T.L. Osborne? T.L. Osborne. Great evangelist, pioneered crusade evangelism. He's gone home to be with the Lord, but just a, a, a mighty evangelist that shook nations. But he was at a preacher's conference, like a preacher's convention, and he took, held up a dollar bill. And he said, I put as much value on this $1 bill as I put on one soul. And then, of course, a bunch of preachers there kind of shook their heads at him and just kind of looked at him and got up and walked out. Se several people got up and walked out like they didn't get it. They didn't get it. Why was he saying? Because he got to the point where literally for $1, he could bring one soul into the kingdom. That's what he was trying to say. So this $1 I'm holding in my hand equals one soul. Why? Because he was after souls, but he realized to put those crusades together, he needed to have the money. And he was trying to say to the preachers, get behind the vision. For every dollar you invest in the kingdom, it's one soul. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And I mean, think about this. Listen, think about this now. I mean... Sometimes, you know, I mean, you, you hear about these ministries, they'll come, they'll rent a stadium, and they'll pack it out maybe with 30, 40,000 people, and they might have an altar call with five or six or seven or eight, ten, let's say 10,000 people. Let's say 12,000 people. Sometimes it'll cost two to three million dollars to get a crusade like that to get 12,000 souls. We're getting 12,000 souls for, for just, come on, our church is like getting 12,000 souls. And we're not spending three million. I mean, it just takes people to commit commitment and get out there, you know? Come on, somebody. Some of y'all have led more people to the Lord by yourself than some so called evangelists. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You, you don't realize how much treasure you have in heaven already, some of y'all. Like one of the kids said, you know, woke up the mom in the morning and said, Mom, I wanna go soul winning because I wanna get crowns. Because that's what they're learning in kids' church. The crown of the soul winner. Hallelujah. We all need to be appreciative of the fact that you're going out winning souls. We're going to have many crowns. Everyone in this church is going to have the crown of the soul winner. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Soul winner's crown. Did you know that there is a crown called the soul winner's crown? One of the many crowns. Hallelujah. Eternal purpose. Everyone say eternal purpose. Confession non comes or, or is concerning doing business with God. How many of you heard me here at the altar call saying to people, if you mean business with God, God means business with you. You got to do some business with God. You know how you do business with God? When I take care of God's business, he takes care of my business. 
Haggai chapter 1, the Lord said, my house lies in ruins. Come and build my house. If you build, if you build God's house, he'll build your house. Yeah. Hallelujah. And what you do for the kingdom, God will do for you. What you do for others, God will do for you. Hallelujah. So you, sometimes you got to do business with God. Amen. I come to God and I ask him for big things. Big things. Because I know he's a big God. Where he leads, he feeds. Where he guides, he provides. Nothing is too big for God. So I ask largely. 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 Ginormously. I will do great and mighty things for a great and mighty God. Philippians 4 and 6. We serve a mighty God. We serve a big God. And he wants to be big through us. But the bigger he is in you, the bigger will be through you. So he needs to become big on the inside of you. So don't put God in a little, tiny little box here. Your little Sunday morning, one hour, two hour, three hour little compartment. God needs to be involved in every, every area of your life. You got to do business with God. Jesus said, I am about my father's business. I'm about my father's business. And I do business with God. You know why I do business with God? When I've done the word, I go to the Lord because he says, let us contend together. I remind him of his word. Lord, you said in your word. If I do this, this is what you will do for me. So I am now coming to contend with you. I'm not coming to do some business with you. Let's have a meeting. Let's have a brainstorming session. Let's have a a uh, Holy Ghost storm session here. You know, let, let's come on, Lord. Let's sit down here. I mean, you've put this in my spirit. I'm believing. I'm speaking it. And I'm expecting you to come through for me. And that takes the pressure off of me and puts the pressure back on the word of God. Hallelujah. You got to put the pressure on the word of God. Hallelujah. Some of you are feeling all the pressure on yourself, like you got to make it happen. Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. Come on, some of you, you've been feeling all the pressure, like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. Come on, lift your hands right now and just say, Lord, I give everything to you. I cast all my cares on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your burden is light. Your yoke is easy. I come to learn of you. I step into the into rest by faith i'm trusting you i'm believing that you're going to perform what you said you will do your promises are yes and amen i'm standing on your word i'm standing on your promises hallelujah i'm standing on your word if you said it i believe it hallelujah i believe it that settles it for me i don't care what Aunt susie says i don't care what cnn says Hallelujah. I don't care what circumstances are telling me. I'm believing your word. If your word says it, that settles it. That's enough for me. I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I believe it. Don't just sing it, live it. If you said it, I believe it. I'm taking a hold of the word. I'm holding fast to the confession of faith. And if you read that in the Greek, it means I'm not going to waver in what I say. I'll speak. I, my speech will be consistent because the enemy will come try to shake your faith and circumstances and you start to speak against the word. And you actually, when you speak against the word, you're actually working against yourself. But you got to be careful that your mouth doesn't work against you. Hallelujah. Don't start a forest fire with that little, tiny, little, tiny, little spark from your tongue. No man can tame the tongue. Guess who tames the tongue? Holy Ghost, speak in tongues. What are you doing? I'm taming my tongue. What are you saying? None of your business. I'm not talking to you right now. 
I'm not talking to you. I'm speaking mysteries unto God. No man understands me. I'm taming my tongue. I'm making sure my tongue is speaking and praying the perfect will of God. Hallelujah. And then you take the word. You confess these confessions. This is how you also tame the tongue. By speaking in tongues and speaking the word, you tame the tongue. You use the power of the tongue. Right? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You use the power of the tongue. You use the power of life. To your, to your advantage. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So, so I, we give you these confessions. Don't just, you know, take that bulletin, fold it up, stick it in your Bible. Take it. Confess these all this month. Take these out. Confess them every day. Who's going to do it? Okay. We'll check again next week who's actually done it. Because that's where the issue is. I'm sorry to say you got to put in the work. you got to do some business with God. You take these, you confess them. You're doing business with God. Hallelujah. And the final confession, 10, concerns kingdom business vision. I believe God is raising me up to be one of the millionaires that will fund the end time harvest. We have any millionaires in the house being raised up? God help me to be a steward of unlimited funds. I will keep my hands clean, my heart pure, so that God can increase me. I will hear the Lord say, well done, you good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. That comes from Matthew 25, 21. So kingdom business vision. Hallelujah. Have a vision. Have a vision for your life. People perish without vision. Come on, lift your hands. Father, I just pray over every single person in this church, those watching on the broadcast, right now I speak. I speak into their spirit. Heaven's vision to be burnt into their spirit by the fire of the Holy Ghost. May they be branded in their spirit. May they be branded in their spirit by heaven's eternal vision. That they will run with the vision of heaven. That they will run with the vision of heaven. Hallelujah. Glory to God that they will run with the vision of heaven and they will not look back. They'll be single minded. They'll never be double minded. They'll trust in you. They'll walk with you. They'll walk in the spirit, not fulfill the lust of the flesh. They won't be distracted. Hallelujah. They'll be focused and that vision will burn in their belly like an unquenchable fire. Hallelujah. Unquenchable fire and an all consuming fire that will just, they'll be consumed by it. And that same fire will consume anything that is, that is not in the plan and purpose of God. Anything that is not in the plan and purpose of God for their lives will, will be consumed by the fire of God. It'll turn into ashes and then they'll have heaven's vision burning in them. There'll be no fleshly visions but it'll be heaven's vision and they'll run with heaven's vision they'll be kingdom builders in jesus mighty name